everyone out there in the live stream. Hey, Brian. Hey, Anastasia. Hello. Hello. Hey, great to be here with you both and everyone out there listening. Please put some comments and thoughts into the live stream, and we'll try to make it part of the show. And with that, uh, let's kick this off. Hello and welcome to Python Bytes, where we deliver Python news and headlines directly to your earbuds. This is episode 236, recorded June 2nd, 2021. I'm Michael Kennedy. And I'm Brian Ockett. And I'm Anastasia Timoshuk. Hey, Anastasia. So great to have you here. Nice to have you on the show. Yeah, it's nice. Yeah, Thank why don't you tell people... You. Yeah, absolutely. Why don't you tell people a little bit about yourself before we get into the topics? Yeah, sure, of course. So I'm joining from Germany, Berlin, remotely right now, and um, I have a little one, a baby dog, joining as well. <laughs> you might hear him <laughs> on the stream. Um, I am originally from Ukraine. I'm not German. I moved to Germany around five years ago, maybe five and a half. Um, and my passion is Python. I used to be a C++ developer, game developer, and so many more languages, but the best one, I think, for me is Python. So I decided to stick with it for around eight years now. Oh, how and, cool. I, I started yeah. out doing my professional programming in C++. And I don't know, Brian still touches a little bit of C and C++ in his world. So that, that's cool. Yeah, nice. it's a, half my life. Yep. <laughs> so Nice. And what kind of games? Uh, well, they were um, adapted first uh, for iPad. They were like two and a half D games. And then later on, it was mostly 3D games with uh, Unreal Engine. So yeah, wow. that was oh, cool. Fun. Yeah, that, that's awesome. All right. Well, once again, welcome. Welcome. So glad to have you here. Brian, do I have the first item this time around? No, you do. Go for it. Okay. What do you got well, for us? Um, well, accessibility isn't really some. I probably should think about accessibility more, but I, I don't really. Um, but I probably should. So I was uh, excited to see there was a tweet uh, recently by Matthew Feichart that said, um, I need to give some serious praise to a fellow scikit hep dev, Hans Deminsky, on his excellent monolens tool for uh, interactive simulations of colorblindness. So I checked this out. So monolens is this is a Python package, and you can uh, pip install it. And um, as uh, Matthew said, you can uh, pip x install it. So you just always have it around, which is nice. Um, and it, it just pops up this tool, this uh, this really cool um, window, and you can just um, you can just drag it around, and it makes the whatever the windows over. Uh, all over your desktop, it just makes it black and white instead of color. So you can see what it looks like uh, in grayscale. So um, I, one of the things I really liked about this is, um, is, is the, the, the example showing it with, um, with Matplotlib and plots because plots are really where you're using color to distinguish between to, to different sets of data. So you really kind of want that data to look different, even if people don't see color. So that's that's an important thing. Um, so that was neat. And then uh, somebody that replied to that and said, "Hey, um, uh, I always try to use C Smasher. Smasher. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> it is a to make sure they're colorblind friendly. So I'm like, I've never heard of this. So I went and checked out uh, Smashers and uh, what it what it is is it's a bunch of uh, color maps, so you don't really have to think about it. So you, um, so all, there's all these great named color maps, and they're uh, they're actually fairly attractive color changes. But the um, uh, it shows you what it, they look like in black and white also. So they um, this isn't uh, it's kind of a little demo at the at the top that we're looking at on the stream, but the code that you have to you just it's just kind of built into matplotlib already like it's an it's also kind of an extension to matplotlib and other things that use color maps so you can just say when you're plotting you can just specify a color map like rainforest or something and it it automatically is a colorblind um, uh, friendly color map so you can do your plots and have it still look nice everywhere so oh yeah this is really cool and Matthew friend of the show thanks for sending that in um, I never really had thought about this and I should have, you know, I mean, I feel like maybe I should go over my websites and go, uh, do they look terrible for people 
who have, you know, color vision impairments and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, so really cool. And it looks like it's this independent thing that will just go over. You just move your mouse around. It works on anything. It doesn't necessarily have to do with Jupiter or Matplotlib or something like that, right? Right. So the mono lens is just a, it's just something that works on anything. I could, I drag it over even my desktop, my background, uh, and it showed, uh, showed the, the picture in black and white. So, um, cool. it is cool. The other and, thing is, wait, there's uh color maps. I can just add to, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Matplotlib. That's cool. Like rainforest yeah, I, and stuff. How neat. I, I didn't know you could just do that. So that's a, uh, it's kind of a neat thing. And then you can, like, for instance, the, the, one of the uh, examples that they have on the CMash or readme, um, is just, uh, just sort of a, a simple plot. And when you're and Matplotlib kind of just picks colors for you, unless you specify colors for different plot lines. Um, but you can just, you can give it a color map instead of a, um, a specific, uh, list for each item. Um, yeah. so, and that just kind of, that's nice. That's, why that's not do it? Neat. Yeah. Why not do it? Anastasia, what do you think? Oh, it looks amazing, really, and it's super helpful. Yeah, um, never, never, well, never thought of that, but that would be great to use it as well. For sure. Um, when you were doing games, did you have to think about this kind of stuff? No, actually, we were not that far at that time. It was around seven years ago, eight. Mm, yeah. So, yeah. The on the on the Monolens site, one of the examples they show is using. Um, having one of the plots use some sort of pattern underneath and not just color. And that's, that's, I'm not sure how to do that. So people that are great at Matplotlib probably know how to do that really right away, but that's kind of a neat idea also to have like one of the, one of the graphs has hashes versus stars or slant lines or something like that. So, oh yeah. I have it like a, some sort of ASCII differentiator. Yeah. Yeah. So something Very extra. Nice. Yeah, this is super helpful. And Matthew, again, thanks for sending it in. And uh, Joy, yeah, welcome to the live stream. Thanks for, for being here for the recording. So the next one I want to talk about is something called Rapid Fuzz. Rapid Fuzz. So, yeah, so last time I talked when we had Vincent on, I saw the fuzzy wuzzy, fuzzy text matching for that that chatbot that he was showing off i thought yeah. oh fuzzy wuzzy is cool so M michael hankala sent in uh rapid fuzz and it's very much like fuzzy wuzzy but it turns out to be a whole lot faster and it uses some of the same ideas but you know coming back to the some of the things we were talking about it is basically written in c plus plus using the levenstein distance algorithm for words similarities uh, but obviously has a Python API that we all work with. And so, yeah, it, it's pretty neat. It's really easy to work with. You just, again, pip install it, and then you can come down here and do things like fuzz.ratio, and you can give it two sentences. This is a test, or this is a test, exclamation mark, and it says that's 96.5% the same. Or um, you have fuzzy wuzzy was a bear. I guess these are... Yeah, fuzzy wuzzy was a bear. I guess those are, are those the same. No, wuzzy yeah. fuzzy. Oh, wuzzy fuzzy. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. Got to read better. Wuzzy fuzzy was a bear versus fuzzy wuzzy was a bear. Oh my goodness, uh, that's ninety percent <laughs> the same. Given a bunch of uh, phrases, you can sort them by similarity. You can say, kind of use selection, like uh, you know, a call in, sort of call center type of automation. Given three choices. And given some text, you can say, find which one, you know, like mm. Atlanta Falcons, New York Jets, New York Giants, and so on. If somebody says, you know, lowercase New York Jets instead of uppercase, it'll say, well, uh, here's the likelihood that that's a match, but here's another possible match that's, you know, and it gives you the ratios of how good of a match it is. So if you've got a select set of choices and you're asking for input on it, you can just say, well, give me the closest match. And if it's anywhere close, you can just run with that. So, yeah, pretty neat, right? That is pretty cool. Yeah. And the other thing that's interesting is the performance. And the four people tell me that all, all benchmarks are broken and they don't work. You know, sometimes at least they give you a sense. So here's some of the things that uh, they've got in terms of performance, say, versus Fuzzy Wuzzy. And the numbers are like 10 or 20 times faster. Mm, it's yeah, definitely probably. broken. 
<laughs> it's definitely broken. I think it's because it's written in C++ instead of Python uh, at most of its core, you know, probably. But anyway, if you're looking for fuzzy text matching, fuzzy wuzzy is a good option. And apparently, thanks to Miko, rapid fuzz is as well. So yeah, pretty neat. Yeah, we probably should do a segment on benchmarks at some point. No, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> that's not no we should do it but i've written blog posts and stuff on it and it's just an endless battle of you're doing it wrong your situation is not my situation and in my situation it's not as good or it's worse or it's better or you're yeah no i i hear you it, it would be interesting but at the same time yeah okay there we go we just had a section on uh benchmarks so. yeah i've already just explained like the emotional trauma that i'll go through from receiving all the feedback now it's <laughs> anastasia what do you think about this um um, fuzzy text matching. Well, maybe next time we can organize a battle between them. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, we'll bring some in. Yeah, sure. Do you have any use for this fuzzy text matching, string matching stuff? Well, actually, yes, at work. Uh, we have uh, lots of uh, matching algorithms, but we are using uh, different tools. I and mean, I'm not a data scientist person, but I would love to try that, actually. Looks super <laughs> cool. Yeah, we, we use some C++ libraries. Well, cool. Yeah. Yeah, Robert out there in the live stream says that we would have to benchmark the episode if we had an episode <laughs> about benchmarking. You see, it's like recursion. Well, save that thought for the end of the show, yeah. by the way. All right, Anastasia, you, you're up next. Structured okay. logging, tell us about it. Uh, well, a few years ago, I um, went to a meetup and I heard a talk from Mal Marcus Holterman about struct log. That's the first time when I heard about this, and I decided to give it a try. And actually, I fell in love with it, uh, and I'm using it uh, since at least two and a half years, maybe two. Um, it's an awesome way to bring a bit of structure to your logs to make them more visible and more usable, because usually how we log, it's like just one huge sentence, which is readable by humans, but it's not machine readable. And the idea is here um, to bring more structure to build some dashboards based on uh, different keys and then values, and then see what's actually happening with the system without touching the logs, without scrolling through the whole log and then uh, just reading all bunch of things. Um, and I already used it in production. It looks pretty well if uh, you try using JSON format, it's just fantastic. Oh, how cool. Yeah, you can pass it all these like processors, yeah, processors. and type stuff. So you can say, render out the, or print the, you know, stack info, the log level, timestamp, yeah, had... all those kinds of things. That's neat. We added a bunch of uh, processors, like custom made, which were specifically designed for our applications, which made a life of our DevOps parsing the logs way easier because they didn't have to write them <laughs> by hand. And oh, nice. if you use uh, structured logs for all applications, not just one, but uh, for example, microservices, and you pass um, the key ID or like trace ID or something that will identify the path which uh, uh, the log goes through, then you might see what happened before the bug happened. Or maybe beca because uh, if you want to see uh, how the system is working, you also need to be either one of the detectives of the system or use the struct log. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting. When you log out stuff, it looks like you can just do key keyword arguments, and those will add to the yeah. log really nice. You don't have to create a message that you're going to send that embeds, you know, the yeah. value, you know, variable equals valuable, variable equals value. You just pass them to the log message and they become part of the, the message like that. That's cool. Yeah. And you can also use uh, the initial message, which is an event like greeted here um, as some kind of key, uh, which would give more clues where this message is coming from and what type of event happened instead of a usual message. Yeah, nice. Very cool. The other thing it says is if you have Colorama installed, it will automatically render in nice colors. Uh, that's very neat. I love Colorama, and I love having colors in um, in the code that we look at. It really makes a, a nice difference. So yeah, you get things like the colored, uh, whether it's uh, an info message or an error and, and whatnot. Yeah, 
Very neat. I like it. I keep rem- meaning to use this more, and I now I'm bl- I'm glad you brought it up because I definitely want to try this. So. Definitely yeah. try this. Yeah, so yeah. This cool. is a really good one. This, this is new to me, but uh, quite neat. All right, not new to me, but also quite neat is our sponsor for this episode. So this episode is brought to you by Sentry. So how would you like to l- remove a little stress from your life? Do you worry that users may be having difficulties and encountering errors with your app right now? Would you even know until they send that support email? I mean, yes, maybe you're using struck log, but are you watching the struck log now? You don't know, right? So how much would it, how much better would it be if you had that error or performance details immediately sent to you with the call stack and local variables and active user and all that stuff? And with Sentry, it's not just possible, it's easy. We use Sentry on all of our web apps, Python Bytes.fm, Talk Python Training, all those kind of things. And we know if there's some kind of problem. It's unfortunate if someone hits a problem, but it's better to know and be able to fix it right away. In fact, one time somebody ran into a problem over at Talk Python training, getting a course, and I got the message. I could see who was logged in when they had the problem, and I actually fixed the bug and was about to push out the changes, and I got an email, hey, I'm having a problem with your your site. I'm like, yeah, I know. I just fixed it. Uh, <laughs> try again, please. And they were a quite a surprise. So surprise and delight your users today. Create your Sentry account at Python by setfm slash Sentry. And please, when you're signing up, click the got a promo code redeem option and enter Python Bytes. It's not automatic. And so make sure that you enter Python Bytes as the promo code. Otherwise, they won't know it's from us. You'll get a bunch of cool stuff, two free months of the team plan with many more errors and events and other features as well. So check them out at Python by setfm slash Sentry. That's pretty awesome. Um, Brian, I guess you should probably also test your code maybe before you yeah. end up with errors. What do you think? <clears throat> Definitely. And um, actually, before we go on, I think I've mentioned this before, but the graphic on that is on the Sentry page is so cool. I know. I really like it, too. Like, I I love the upset console terminal reading of paper. Yeah. (laughs) So um, this is (laughs) this is kind of like inside baseball, maybe. But I don't know. Maybe three people might care about this. But anyway, I'm one of them. So um, uh, XFail now works with PyTest subtests. So... That's it's neat, uh, but I gotta explain it a little bit. So, subtests are kind of this weird uh, feature of unit tests that came along in Python 3.4, and it's a way it's a context manager so that you can have possibly uh, several places where your test might fail, but continue. It doesn't stop um, if it fails, and that's a uh, uh, that was within unit test. Pytest had. Um, well, PyTest said PyTest check, the plugin that I wrote um, that allows something similar, Context Manager. But um, then PyTest subtests came out, which was a plugin in about 2019 that started that um, that allowed you to run the unit test subtests within from PyTest. But there's also a PyTest style of doing subtests also. They're a bit quirky. So um, I'm going to, we, I'm linking to, uh, um, two, two resources, um, an article by Paul Gansel and an uh, episode of Testing Code where he and I talk about subtests. And so they're a little, before you jump in and use them right away, you should know some of the quirks about them. But they're still cool if, if they work for you. But one of the quirks that was around for a long time was that xfail didn't work. And xfail is a way to say, I know my test is going to fail, um, uh, but, you know, and then you get to decide whether or not you want to make mark it as an X pass or mark it as a fail if it, if it fails. Um, and the, uh, this anyway, X fail didn't work with subtests, but it does now as of like the start of the month. So somebody named maybe Sibber on uh, GitHub, um, maybe, maybe. <laughs> uh, merged a fix or submitted a fix as a pull request and it got merged and it's now in version 050. So XFail, if you wanted to use subtests, XFail now works with them. So that's the good news. So. Yeah. Yeah, this looks really interesting. So the basic idea is I, I want to loop over a bunch of scenarios or whatever, maybe test them all and then have the test fail if any of them did, but actually just go through them all before. Yeah, so like in, in on the on the subtests um, site, there's a little example. So like, let's say you're looping through a range and you want to you want to run all of them, 
within not not a parameterized just within the test you're doing like several things and you can yeah and if something fails you want to actually report all of the failures um and this is this is you know sort of helpful with loops but you know why not just use parameterization um but the 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 one part where it does really help is if you really are checking like four or five different things and you really want to know like let's say you're uh, measuring something or you're checking uh, several dimensions of something and um, and having all of the failures together would help you determine what the real problem is so uh, it's a it's it's, it's oh, yeah, when a you have, to have all the information this is a good idea so. very cool Anastasia, what's the testing story in your world? Well, we, we use mostly parameterized testing because we don't have the subtest need. We don't need to test it multiple times. But maybe in the future. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be useful. Hey, uh, parameterized works, so I'd stick with it. So. Yeah. yeah, it's definitely good. All right. Another thing that I think is really neat to talk about, but... I feel like it's almost down to the benchmark type of situation is what do you do with the secrets in your application? There's shgit, SSH git, which is always terrifying. If you go here, you can see, oh, here's all the code that we found in this branch of this GitHub repository. For example, here's your you know, database connection string with username and password right there, right? So... You can see all kinds of issues if you go over here. There's like a, even a live stream. If it doesn't feel bad enough, you go like watch the live stream <laughs> of all the things that are coming in. Like right now, apparently, there's some username and password and a URI and some kind of private key and whatnot. So you don't want that. So what do you do? Well, there's all kinds of things you can do. Do you encrypt those secrets and put them in source code? Well, then where do you store the encryption key? There's some kind of certain types of vaults you can install on your server, kind of like one password, but for servers, you could do that kind of thing. There's just leave it in there and hoping for the best. There's put it in, in environment variables. That's a very, very common one, right? But still, no matter what you pick, you kind of got to get that data back and deal with it. So I want to introduce you to Pydantic. Brian, you've heard of Pydantic, right? Yeah. In fact, <laughs> I didn't know this if, had anything to do with secrets. Yeah, if you go to Pydantic, right here at the top, I believe there might be um, some nice little comment here. Oh, yeah, I thought uh, I thought you were in here, but apparently I'm in here right now. I think it toggles between us. Anyway, yeah. So we we've known we the point is we've really talked about. It pedantic a lot it's a really cool way to create these classes that are kind of like data classes point them at some data source and then they validate it and adapt it right so if i've got like a json document it has a field in it and that field is a list of something i could say in my model this thing has a list of integers and if it happens to be quote a string uh, or is a number that has quotes on it it'll just you know automatically do the int parse type of thing to get it fixed or it'll tell us that it couldn't figure out what to do with the third value. Something like that. It's really fi fantastic. But what I also didn't know was that it has built-in support for working with these user secrets. So Dennis Roy uh, pointed this out to me. And there's all kinds of things. You can have the .env file. You can have Docker secrets. You can have environment variables. And all of these things as your secrets. And if you just derive from, instead of base model, you derive from base settings, then this will automatically determine the, the any of the fields that are not passed to it from the environment or from .env files. What do you think? Well, that's cool. Where do the .env files go? <laughs> not in GitHub. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, you know, you store them somewhere else, right? You probably... What ideally I think you do is you would store like an env template file that has, you know, put this value and then the real value here, this value and the real value there. And then you, of course, uh, ignore, get ignore the other one, the real one, right? So you at least have a structure. But so the idea is you come down here and say, I've got these settings and we've got like an API key and an auth key. We've got a Redis connection, all those kinds of things. And 
you can even say, I'm going to put a prefix on it. So in your environment variables, it's fine if you've got one app and one server. But if you've got 10 apps running or 10 APIs running on your server, what does the API key refer to? What is the database connection string with the database name in it refer to? Which one of those 10 apps, right? So you can put a prefix. So you could have like login app API key or, you know, um, logging app API key. And you put that in there and it automatically will just let you access it as if it's API key. So you can sort of configure the environment a little bit better. There's just lots of really neat things that you can do in here to make that work. Um, you can say whether it's case sensitive. Let's see, let me pull up. I have to take some notes, some other things I thought were super cool. So it's a regular Pydantic model which means it will do all the conversions and the validation. So if something is missing that's required from your environment, it'll let you know exactly what's missing. It'll do those conversions. Um, yeah, all sorts of stuff. It has support for raw sequence files as well, which is like a slightly different way to do it. You can have differently named ENV files, like a prod.env versus qnad.env or whatever. Mm. Um, all sorts of settings. So. I've always thought Pydantic is amazing, and I had no idea it had this built-in support for working with this. The other thing that's really cool about this is, if you go back to the top where it describes it, it says, it will try to get these values from the environment if you don't pass them over. So if you're in, say, a testing environment, and you want to actually pass values that would control it, you could just explicitly pass them along instead of ex you know having them come from the environment. So it's really easy to test, you know, set the test values instead of trying to configure a test environment. Nice. We yeah. do use it, by the way, base settings. But we didn't you use do? prefixes. Yes. Yeah. Which is a good idea. <laughs> really yeah, good the idea. prefixes are cool. If you have a bunch yeah. of apps, if you just have one, yeah, like it doesn't really we matter, do. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. Cool. You like this? It's working well for you? Yeah, it's working perfectly well. And we are committing on the development version with some dummy keys just to have them around, of course. <laughs> Of course. Oh, wow. How neat. Okay. Cool, cool. Well, that's neat that you're using it. Um, Brian, you got the next one. Is that right? Um, you've already done no, it. No, but nope. I, I just wanted to mention uh, the... Oh, wait. Um, uh, never mind. I had the wrong <laughs> thing. Oh, um, oh, here we go. Uh, the the quote I think you were looking for was from Fast API. It was not Oh, from yes, API. yes. Of course, of course. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. It is. I'm over the moon. Yeah, super excited about it. Yeah, Fast API is awesome. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, we use it. <laughs> I love Fast API as well. And to me, like Pydantic and Fast API, they go together because I learned about them at the same time. I know they're different people and different projects, but you know, it yeah. works like magic. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It really is. Yeah. And if it's not magic, maybe you should document it. Or maybe if yeah. it is magic, you should document it. <laughs> right, <institution>. Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. Um, actually, I'm the one who is uh, usually bringing this topic uh, to the team, how to write documentation. And first, the question is why to write documentation? Everyone knows that we need documentation, but um, it's hard. It's time consuming. It's annoying. And um, how it usually happens, someone leaves the team, and then the last days, are about handing over everything. And oh my gosh, I remember I've had this experience twice at least. Right. Where it's like, oh, you you said where you said you're going to you've given me your two weeks. So your next two weeks, your two weeks notice that you're going to leave. Your next two weeks will be to start writing documentation for yeah. everything you've ever worked on and anything <laughs> that people might need to do. So your yeah. next two weeks are to begin writing documentation that you should have been doing the whole time. Yeah. In Germany, we have a notice period of three months. So like it's Oh, that's three a months. lot of documentation writing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just kidding. But <laughs> normally, even if you leave the team, like you, for example, move from one team to another, you do it doesn't mean that you have to leave the company. Uh, still, you have to hand over everything that you worked for, let's say, in a year or even uh, half of the year. And um, for example, in my experience, when I started with Python, I didn't know any Python, I had to learn it. And of course, I didn't know about Sphinx or read the docs or any kind of documentation for Python. And what did I do? Nothing, I didn't write it. And half a year later, I was wondering who wrote this code. So I did git blame, and of course it was me. And I was like, 
<laughs> what uh -oh. is a different person? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and I suggest to start writing documentation now, even if you're not leaving the team. Um, the reason why I'm bringing up the Sphinx and read the docs is that it will allow to have continuous documentation. And with Sphinx, you can easily um, write just some doc strings, which will explain what the function does, what the, the class is doing, add some uh, input output uh, parameters, and then you will automatically generate it. So there is no need to write it somewhere on Confluence or any other source, because if there are too many sources, that's where the documentation will die, because no one will go and check it. and during the handover, usually it happens like that. You write documentation somewhere where nobody knows where and nobody reads it. <laughs> yeah, you pointed out that you've got it in Jira and you've got it in GitHub yeah. and you've got it in all different places. Google Docs, yes. Yeah, yeah. Especially, especially Google, Google Docs. Docs. Oh, yes. <laughs> and then you share like 10 Google Docs uh, <laughs> with different people and then they lose the links and people are leaving. It's nice when people are leaving the team, but it's not nice to the people who are leaving the team to another team because they are getting all the questions for a year. <laughs> <laughs> Where to find this? How can I get this function? How to get this data? Yeah, yeah, yeah. very good advice. You know, uh, for a long time, Sphinx was like synonymous with restructured text, but now we've also got the marks markdown with the mist parser there. So that's very cool as well. I'm a fan also, of markdown ahead instead, yeah. yeah. And also it supports uh, the Sphinx itself. It supports different um, types of documentation. For example, you can write code reference, then you can go through all the code, and then you can also write um, extra documentation, like Markdown. Even README can be included into documentation. And you can also style it. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah very cool. Yeah, there's lots of great themes to it too now. It really looks attractive. Yeah, you did recently cover that, right, Brian, the Sphinx themes? Yeah, and um, actually, when the the markdown uh, the support came on, that's when I went back and started looking at Sphinx. So the um, a lot some of our documentation uh, is done in Sphinx now because because it does markdown, and you can even make it do it's there's it's not built in, but you can make it read um, doc strings and and interpret doc strings as markdown. So it's cool. Yeah, very cool. Very cool. Robert out in the live stream has an interesting addition to continuous integration and continuous delivery. So can we deploy yet? Only if the documentation is complete. Very Definitely. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. All right. Well, that's it for our main topics. Brian, you got anything you want to share? Any extra stuff you want to throw out there? Uh, mostly I'm, I'm, uh, I'm curious about PyTest uses. So I'll, I'll drop a link in the show notes, but basically I've got a pinned tweet on my uh, Twitter on my Twitter and I'd like to have people tell me where they see um, uh, where they they're using PyTest. Um, so uh, I've, I've got some examples and then I, I kind of went I, I, my first question was people projects that have switched um, but I was looking at just the just the guts of how Python works and there's some amazing projects that use PyTest like wheel pip setup tools warehouse those all use pytest that's pretty cool oh, wow how interesting so, yeah and those yeah. are sort of almost inside of python which is interesting because they're yeah. not using unit tests right yeah so and then i just learned about recently even if it's um proprietary that'd be interesting i just learned that stripe and lyft went through a uh, a pytest conversion recently so that's kind of neat yeah, that's cool yeah yeah very cool anastasia anything else you want to throw out there or let people know about while we're here um yeah, maybe uh, using exceptions. Uh, don't use space exception. Yeah, use great. Cu custom, custom exceptions. That, that, like for your app or have certain... Absolutely, yeah. I, I definitely sec second definitely. that idea. All right. Uh, this and this is in Dane of almost being an extra, 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 extra. Hear all about it. So uh, I'll just go quick. Um, so Matthew Feichert's getting a couple of shout outs on this show. So he, he also pointed out, said, whoa, super cool, Pip X which we've talked about on the show before. It lets you install Python tools, kind of like Homebrew or Apt. They're not part of a project, but you want to have them managed and installed in their own isolated environment. So you pip x instead of pip install a thing, which is great. That is now officially part of PyPA, the Python Packaging Authority. Nice. So 
yeah, pretty cool. So pipx is now sort of officially part of Python, not Python the distribution, but the group, you know. Next, I will be presenting ish. It's, it's recorded, but then there's like a live Q and A afterwards. Uh, live, Manning is having a conference on developer productivity. I don't honestly remember what my top talk is going to be about. Oh, yes, here it is. <laughs> it's 10 tips and tools you can adopt in 15 minutes or less to level up your developer productivity. So I'm going to be speaking on that. Uh, Ooh, all sorts of fun things. Uh, so if you want to check that out, it's free to register for. It's later this month, I guess. Here's just a thought I would throw out there for you. I don't expect an answer, but yikes, cloud bills can uh, pile up. Uh, Alex Chan, who um, is teaching, I guess, I don't, I could figure out exactly the context of this, but said, put out a tweet that said, I have a panicked student in my DMs who accidentally racked up an $8,000 AWS bill. My suggestion of talk to support is no good. Apparently, they won't issue a billing adjustment. <laughs> Anyone got ideas out there? Help. Oh, no. <laughs> could you imagine as a student? I mean, as a professional, it's still a lot of money. But as a student, $8,000 is like a ton of money. <laughs> yeah, it's like a term of bills. It depends on. Yes, exactly. Yeah, like a semester of studies or something. So uh, maybe other students and basically all people out there put up billing alerts on on whatever cloud thing you're doing um, on whatever whatever places I have, including AWS. I get periodically, I get an announcement. It's like, you, your bill is now at $50. Your bill is at $100. Your bill is now at $500. Your bill is now at $1,000. And if it goes beyond that, I'm going to have to start paying a lot of attention to what's going on with my AWS account. So just you know, put these alerts on there. It's usually easy with whatever platform you're on. Um, anyway. Don't be that poor student. All right, what's next? Uh, Brian Skin shouted out, hey, this might not uh, be a total new item, but maybe we can mention it. Maybe it's interesting. Developed a flake, mentioned a flake, eight, didn't develop it, I don't believe, a flake eight plugin for fast API. So if you're doing fast API, there's different ways to do things like routes and whatnot. And there's like the, the natural way and there's sort of a clumsy way. And so here's a flake eight thing to make sure you're doing fast API. Nice. Interesting. Yep. And that I would be useful. think, yeah, yeah. And I think this is my last one. It is my last one here. So Sal Shannonbrook tweeted, JupyterLab 3 will have localization. So localization means like the menus and the help text and the button hover tips and all that kind of stuff are localized for different languages. So JupyterLab 3 will have localization, making it more approachable for people who don't want to work in an English UI. And they're crowdsourcing translations. So if you wanted to contribute to Jupyter and you were good at programming in a language that's not English, because it's already done in English, you know, go check that out. That would be kind of cool. I wonder if anybody just messes with people and like, does wrong translations just for fun. I'm so afraid of that, yeah. <laughs> I think they do. <laughs> I bet they do. I bet they do. And maybe not really obvious, maybe in real subtle ways. Yeah. 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 D never mind. Don't, 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 don't yeah, have don't, any ideas. Brian, don't give people ideas. This is not. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, that's all the extras as well. So how about a joke? Yeah. Okay. So... Imagine you're learning programming, you're learning Python. Take one of these computer science courses where they talk about weird things like recursion. So recursion is the idea that the function calls itself with different parameters, right? Like a really common example would be factorial. So if I'm going to calculate a factorial, it's just n times n minus 1 times n minus 2. So that's just n times factorial of the the smaller number. You can just like work your way back, right? But there should be an exit condition, like if n equals 1, <laughs> return. Don't keep recursing. So here's a nice little graphic um, under the banner of only programmers would understand. And it's got uh, the four squares. It's kind of like screen sharing. we got that infinite view. So learn to program in one corner. Next corner, make recursive function. Third corner, no exit condition. And then it just repeats and repeats and repeats down to smaller and smaller and smaller. I love it. This is bad. <laughs> no, this is good <laughs> that's how you learn that's right no 
yeah. yeah, exactly. It's like when you share your screen in Zoom or or maybe Google Meet, but you've still got the window up or something like that. But it's about recursion. It's beautiful. And then Google you silence uh, base exceptions and you cannot exit the program. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> Do you know if, um, yeah. Do you know if Python has a tail recursion optimization? I'm Sorry. thinking. I'm thinking. No, like so. The whole point is here, Brian, that we would run out of a call stack space really quickly, and that's usually the error: stack overflow error if you recurse too deep, type of thing. Yeah. But with trail recursion, it basically becomes an infinite loop, so you run out of time instead of memory. Okay. So, but I don't. So that would be the advantage of tail recursion. I have no idea if it is there or not. Yeah, I mean, there's some languages that do the optimization, so they don't they don't uh, generate a new call stack because there's nothing. Nothing to save. So, but yeah. Anyway, yeah. I don't know. I'm sure we will find out before next week. <laughs> yeah. <it's> one <laughs> of the reasons why I like asking open ended questions on the podcast. So. Yeah. That's awesome. Yep. Well, Brian, thank you as always. And Anastasia, thank you for being here. It was great to have you as a guest. Thanks. Thank you for inviting. Thank you. Yep. Bye. And bye, everyone out there in live stream. <laughs>